for the past. Hey, welcome everybody to today's Clyde Time. It's a great Saturday and we're going to be focusing on the title Before the Past, Before the Past. And as you see there from the earth with the swirls happening, which I, I liken that to be like the light by the Spirit of God. We know the Spirit is faster than the light and we know that the light years are extremely quick. And so we're going to go really, really quick. We're going to zoom on Zoom to before the past, not just going back to the past, but be going further than that. We're going before the past. All righty. So let us get focused on the study today. Amen. As always, we start out with our mission statement, which is we are a group of people desiring to draw closer to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ through Christ Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That means Jesus has a Father. That Father is our Father in the Spirit. So it's important for us to be in the Spirit so that if we're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and God is Spirit, then this is a family affair. So our mission statement is for us to be better family members, connected to our family members, past, present, and future, all at the same time. So the only way that can happen is through the spirit because that realm is outside of time. So while we're in time, we have to be declared as out of time. That can only happen by faith. And so therein lies our mission statement. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. In drawing closer each week, we focus on a particular verse or verses. Today, we're going to focus on 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 17 through 19 in the NIV. And it reads, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. This is some deep deep stuff. We're not going to do a really deep, deep dive, but we will do a little quick little swan dive. In verse 17, therefore, okay, so if anyone is in Christ, is a new creation. That means there's a such thing as an old creation and a new creation, right? It says, well, if you're in Christ, then you're part of the new creation. And then it says the old has gone. So that means your first creation, the first creation. So there's two creations. There's an old creation and there's a new creation. So when you come into the world, you're part of the old creation. What's the old creation? The creation that we read about in Genesis 1, where Adam and Eve were the first two. And that's the old creation. But in John 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, that's a new creation. But that's interesting that that's being considered the new creation because in the beginning was the word is before the world. So that new creation has to reference us connecting to that, that which was before the creation of the world. And so it's a new creation for us. That means we're being considered new. We're gaining access into that concept. What's that? The word became flesh. And so God is calling that a new creation. That means that old creation, you coming into the flesh in the world and Adam and Eve and the fall of mankind and all of that stuff, that's gone. So it's no longer applicable. The way you came into the world, born into sin, Adam and Eve and the fall of mankind is not applicable if you are in Christ. So therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. 
Well, this is in 2 Corinthians, this is almost 2,000 years ago. We're in 2022 AD. And so if the new is here almost 2,000 years ago, then it's been here by the time we're reading this today. So the new has to be applicable to us today. We definitely have to take hold of that today if it's over, already almost 2,000 years old. And in verse 18, it says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself. So that's part of that new creation. The new creation is us being reconciled to God through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So therein lies the ministry. So being a part of the ministry is a ministry where we're part of the reconciliation team where we're helping people to reconcile to God. Now, a lot of people understand that, but not a lot of people understand that the new is here. I'm hearing people say, well, that means that we don't sin as much as we used to do. And you heard me many times say, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? That can't be what the new is all about. The new can't be what I don't sin as much as I used to because the old creation already said that if you send one time, you were separated from God. So why would God go from you sin one time and you're separated from me to you don't sin as much as you used to, but you're reconciled to me? That says it doesn't make any sense. So obviously reconciliation means something else. It means that the old is gone that means the order of that the rule of that the law of that is no longer applicable to you that means that the reconciliation means something else is applicable to you that's what we want to learn about and talk more about today in the verse 19 it says that god was reconciling the world to himself in christ so christ is the reconciliation process. Christ is the reconciliation one, right? One ticket to heaven, one ticket to paradise. So we gotta be in Christ Jesus to be given that reconciliation status. So what does it mean to be in Christ? It says a new creation. That means a creation that is being described in John one. And it says here, clear as day, not counting people's sins against them. It does not say you sin less. It doesn't say, and because these people sin less, right? So you, we can't be making stuff up, putting it in where God's not saying what we're saying. We have to say what he's saying, right? It's the word says we have to speak the very words of God. His very word says, not counting people's sins against them so one the old does count the sins against you the new is not counting the sins against you why because jesus died for them and that is why it says there and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation what we're reading is the word of god so god is saying I'm saying with my own mouth, the word that says not counting people's sins against them. Why? Because you're still in the flesh. So if you got baptized and washed your sins away and a baptism in and of itself actually did it, which it doesn't, just use common sense based on this passage alone and that'll tell you that's not true, right? Because why? Because you get baptized and then you, you go back and you sin at some point. Right, because we all fall short of the glory of God and none of us are perfect except for Christ Jesus. So we have to be in his righteousness, in his perfection. And if that's the case, that's the message of reconciliation. Now it's up to Christ Jesus to, de to determine how he wants to judge us. He's not judging us on our quote unquote sin. He's judging us by something else. Now you can still be sinning and you can sin it up and that's not good, but it's not gonna be the sin that's the issue. It's gonna be that which is pushing you, making you fall into sin, that 
dwellingfulness of going into sin that you want to do. And all that's going to be based on a lack of faith. As God says, anything that does not come from faith comes from sin. So faith and grace is going to be the new program as it relates to the new creation, not the old program. So you can't say, oh, uh, I'm good. I received the Holy Spirit. And that means I don't sin as much as I used to. And therefore I'm good. That makes no sense at all. Hopefully 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 19. And you can go ahead and read the rest of 2 Corinthians 5. Hopefully that'll help you gain the conviction that that false tale, wise tale about sinning less makes you righteous, that you can throw that away and just move forward with, I need to get my faith intact. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. As always, we like to start out with an opening prayer. And in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, in the NIV it says, For sin shall no longer be your master, but you are not under the law, but under grace. So here it is, that God's making it even a bit more clear about this same subject, subject matter as it relates to being a new creation and what new rules and regulations are related to that versus the person that you used to be, the old self in the rules and regulations that related to that. So he's saying here, for sin shall no longer be your master. Well, when did sin become our master? When mankind failed by listening to the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, which the serpent told the woman and the man, and they ate of it. That's when sin became our master. And so Jesus came to defeat sin, take the keys, and now he's the master. And so that Christ is our master, he's telling us his rules because he's the master. And so whatever his rules are, are the rules that we must go by. We can't be making up rules for sin shall no longer be your master. So that's not determining your status one way or another because it's no longer applicable because you are not under the law, but under grace. Well, grace doesn't mean that, you know, you sin less or you just given a, 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 a green card, white card, a blue card, whatever color card you want to say, a, a get out of jail free card to just run up and send it up. And as a result, then you can just hand this get out of jail free card and say, I have grace. Jesus Christ is going, no, 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 no. Faith is faith in grace. So now where is your faith? You go, I got faith, I got faith, but I'm sending it up. Jesus is going, no, 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 that don't make any sense. So faith is a whole nother ball game. We have to learn all about what the rules are as it relates to faith and then start living by those rules and sin will not be your master. Faith and grace will be your master, which is faith in Jesus Christ and the grace that comes from Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is your master, not sin. So we're going to open up this prayer. Uh, we want to ask Brother Nino to do it. He isn't feeling well, but I know he's got the powerful Holy Spirit. So I'd rather him do it not feeling well because that, that's a demonstration of God's power. So Nino, if you would go ahead and open us up, brother, we would greatly appreciate it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. And here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for just everything that you give us, God. We pray that we can be uh, just broken free from the shackles of sin and disappointment and really all the things that hinder us from reaching you, Father. You've given us grace, Father, so that we are a new creation in front of you, Father. You've given us the blood of Christ that washes us purely and makes us whole before you, Father. You've given us a counselor. You've given us the Holy Spirit, Father. You've given us a partner in the faith, and you have given us things that we just cannot see, but we feel with our hearts and our spirits, God. Please allow us to feel that life of renewal with our spirit, Father, and go forth and help others to feel it, Father. 
We are sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And part of that is the faith that we have that Christ was resurrected so that we can have new life, Father. Allow us to have new life today, Father. Allow us to be lightning rods for your power and be able to affect other people's lives in a positive way, whether it's through learning, whether it's through educating ourselves and helping others, whether it's just be having a kind word or doing random acts of kindness, Father, because for every person whose life we touch, Father, we help them understand that there is something better out there. God, thank you again. Be with Rodney and Jess Jessica as they celebrate, uh, Father, uh, life. And uh, God, just be with everybody else. If they're sick or not feeling well, Father, help them be healed. For all of those who see this recording, Father, uh, help them also feel the power of this, Father, and know that they're part of our family, even though they're not here. For all those near and all those far away, we love you. And we thank you for their presence in our life and your grace and your spirit. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen to the amen. Thank you, Brother Nino. Uh, really appreciate it. Great prayer. Holy Spirit is moving powerfully. And so let us continue to move forward here because it is time to play the recap game. So I hope you guys are fired up and excited, ready to go. You remember what we talked about last week or you went during the week and you checked it out again or you already know what's up here. So let us get started with Question number one, what did Jesus Christ say eternal life is? Was it A, that they may pray Jesus into their hearts and know the pastor? Was it B, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent? Was it C, that everything stays the same for now, but will be awesome after they die? Or D, that people will follow a leader's doctrine without knowing if it is biblical? What did Jesus Christ say eternal life is? Who says, A, that they may pray Jesus into their hearts and know the pastor? All right, who says, B, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. B, 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 definitely. <laughs> All right, who says, C, that everything stays the same for now, but will be awesome after they die. All right, and who says, D, that people will follow a leader's doctrine without knowing if it is biblical. All right, the correct answer is, B, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Very important, very important, because not knowing that, hey, people get caught up all the time. We could get caught up. Anybody can get up going, hey, I'm praying Jesus in my heart, and I know who my pastor is, but, you know, I don't know the one and only true God or Jesus Christ, who's the word of God, right? I don't know any of those things. I just know what my pastor teaches me and tells me that's it. And I go by that. Uh, there's a lot of people rolling like that and see everything stays the same for now, but we'll be awesome after they die. So, you know, there's no new creation concept or they think it's just that I sin less, but everything else is the same. You're still the same person. You still identify yourself with the person that was born on the earth and everything about the earth is about really who you are. And so that's not the answer, right? And then you got, well, people will follow a leader's doctrine without knowing if it's biblical. Uh, the leader told me this, so that's how I'm rolling, right? And, and you kind of just go with that concept. So, A, none of those things are accurate. You know, it's B, that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Question number two, which is the correct phrase that Jesus said when he prayed to the Father? Did he say A, Father, Glorify me in your presence with the glory I received after my birth on earth. B, Father, glorify me in your presence with what I learned while on earth. C, Father, glorify me in your presence based on my sinless status. Or D, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began which is the correct phrase that Jesus said when he prayed to the Father, who says, 
A, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I receive after my birth on earth. All right, who says B, Father, glorify me in your presence with what I learned while on earth. Okay, who says C, Father, glorify me in your presence based on my sinless status. Hmm. And who says D, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I'm gonna go D. with D. I think C or D, I'm tossed. D. D. Yeah. All right, the correct answer is D. Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And let me tell you, I actually appreciate where, you know, someone's saying, hey, I, I see, kind of, I don't necessarily know because I'm going to be honest with you, all of those four concepts people are saying. The, the <laughs> correct answer is D, but the other three people are saying it or acting like it. They, they might say D in being able to quote that particular verse, but then if you start listening, a lot of people describing situations about Christ or what they're holding on to from a faith perspective or a religious perspective, it's oftentimes one of those other three where people act like, okay, well, you know, Jesus is going to get the, the presence and get the glory, but it's only based on after he was born on the earth. That's why people don't see Jesus as Lord of the Old Testament, right? Because it's mm -hmm. only based on after he was born on the earth. There's plenty of people who see it that way. And then you got, well, only what he learned in the earth, right? Well, there's people that are saying, well, you know, he only learned as a man on the earth and he was chosen by God from earth as a man. And they don't see him as a son of God. There's actual whole religions that believe in that particular status. And then you got C where it's saying, okay, glorify me in your presence based on my sinless status. But he took on our sin. He was resurrected because of the faith he had in the father. And that's why we're raised up like him. That is the only way we can be considered brothers and sisters with him is by faith. He's the only one that could be the sacrifice based on his sinless status. So there's a lot of people that think a lot of different variations of those three, not, you know, D, but the correct answer is D. It's the glory he had before the world began. And so that phrase alone should clearly differentiate any thoughts and concepts that are related to A, B, or C. Amen. All right. Question number three, what else did Jesus say? Did he say, A, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. B, sanctify them by their works of the law. C, sanctify them by their advice from one another. Or D, sanctify them by their religious convictions. What else did Jesus say? Who says, A, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. I say A. A. Okay. Who says B? Sanctify them by their works of the law. All right. Who says C? Sanctify them by their advice from one another. And who says D? Sanctify them by their religious convictions. All right, so the correct answer is A, sanctify Ooh. them by the truth. Your word is truth. Now, hey, we can read that and see it, but there's a whole lot of folks that are going by the works of the law. That's part of that, you know, I sin less than I did before, which is not even applicable to the law. The law is one sin and you become a lawbreaker in whole. And then you got to start doing annual sacrifices with bloods of bulls and goats. And so there's people who saying, well, I'm sinning less than I did before. And they're not even offering the blood of goats and bulls. They're not even doing that. But then they're saying, well, because I sin less, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And then you see C where it says sanctify them by the advice from one another. Well, people are living like that where, you know, I'm being sanctified because I'm asking another brother or sister advice all the time. And as a result, 
That's what sanctifying me. Well, if that advice that you're being given is not the truth of the word of God, then it's not sanctification by no means. And indeed, sanctify them by their religious convictions. Well, you know, your particular religious spin or your particular religious group or our particular religious spin or our particular religious group isn't going to sanctify you either. That's how important it is for us to dig in because digging in is us going through a sanctification process. We should always be trying to dig in. We get together with one another. Hey, it should be about digging in, searching for the truth as if it was for hidden treasure, because that's how we're sanctified. Amen. All right. Bonus question number four, which is a part of a statement of Jesus? Is it A, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me in Galilee. Was it B, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am going. Was it C, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. Or was it D, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me after 40 days. Which is a part of a statement of Jesus who says, A, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me in Galilee. All right. Who says, B, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am going. B. All right. Who says, B. okay. Who says, C, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. And who says, D, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me after 40 days. All right. The correct answer is C. Ooh. C. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. And that's very, very interesting because, you know, he was going to Galilee, but that's not what he prayed, prayed to the Father about. He just told them to go meet him there, right? And it wasn't about where he was going, even though he was going somewhere. That's not what he prayed. He actually said, be with me where I am. And he hadn't even ascended yet. So that means that he's talking about a state, being in the kingdom, a status, be with me where I am. He did not have to ascend to be in that kingdom. He was already the king when he resurrected. And that is why he told Nicodemus, you can't see the kingdom because Nicodemus couldn't see him. So he wants us, us to be where he is. And at the time he was on the earth and he had not even ascended yet. Man, that's a riddle. All right. We can focus on that on another day. But just go and look for yourself and see that he said where I am and he had not ascended yet. Very interesting. And of course, he didn't say 40 days from now. So, hey, I want to let y'all know that y'all got game. Thank you so much for playing the game. Really appreciate it. And we have shown some sharpness this morning. So we are really focused and ready to go. Thank you so much. Appreciate it for playing the game. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So it's time to dig in. Today we're going to look at Romans chapter 8. We're going to start it in verses 1 through 10. And again, this is titled Before the Past. And this particular verse starts out with life through the spirit. This is really important to focus in on because we want to know A, what that is and B, how to do it, right? Because if we can, we got some serious victory going on and I know everybody wants to win. So we'll start out in verse one where it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we are seeing this same theme throughout today with the different verses we've looked at that, hey, the sin is no longer our master, sin not being counted against us. And now it's being said again here, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Man, 
just that alone, if you know that and have said it in multiple places now, then being in Christ Jesus is everything, right? So who would not want to focus in on what being in Christ Jesus actually means if being in Christ Jesus means there's now no condemnation, even though you still fall short. But blessed is the one whose sins are not counted against them. And it says in verse two, because, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So I'm going to give you guys a way that I do this, right? It's called the Ben Franklin, where you draw a line on the paper. And so when I'm doing studies like this, on the left-hand side, I would put the law of the spirit who gives life only because it's written first. And on the right-hand side, I'd put, you know, law of sin and death. So I'd put the law of the spirit on one side and the law of sin and death on the other. Whether you put one on the left or one on the right, that's just up to you. Just make sure you put them on two different sides and draw a line. And then as we continue to read the different things that you see in reference to the law of the spirit, right on that side. And the things you see different that says the law of sin and death, put on that side. And then you'll be able to have a clearer idea of what's going on in your compare and contrast, right? So because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Well, the law of the spirit had to set you free. Then you are already in the law of sin and death. And since we saw previously the passage before talked about a new creation versus the old creation, where it said the old has gone. So the old creation is the side where the law of sin and death is, right? The new creation is the side where the law of the spirit is. But on both sides, it says law. So there's a law of the spirit. That one gives life. And then there's the law of sin and death. Obviously, that one gives death. And the law of the spirit frees us from that other side. So this new creation, this higher self, frees us from this older self, from this lower self. Verse three says, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So there you go, the perfect one, the unblemished lamb, Jesus Christ, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. So he came looking like us. Sin and flesh was already condemned because we were born from Adam and Eve. So he came looking like us. That means mankind. We already saw that he was asking God to give him the glory he had before the creation of the world. So he did not come in that likeness. He came in our likeness, looking like us. But what did it say? Verse three says, for the law was powerless to do, right? For what the law was powerless to do, it could not do for us what it needed to do. That's the law of the spirit, right? It couldn't do for us what it needed to do because it was weakened by the flesh. If your flesh, my flesh, Adam and Eve's flesh weakened what the law of the spirit could do, then the law could not keep them at the height that they were or raise them up to the height they could have gotten to by eating of the tree of life. The law in and of itself can't do it. That means the law of the spirit can't do it. And the law of sin and death can't do it. The laws in and of themselves can not do it. So what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, that means that God has made mankind so strong, right? There's no such thing as a weak human. No such thing. If you want to be a drama queen, if you want to be a drama king, if you want to be a hard-headed king, if you want to be a hard-headed queen, 
If you want to be a rebellious queen, you want to be a rebellious king, whatever it is that you decide that you are going to be, it is extremely powerful. A human being is a powerful being. A human being can walk into a room, have a cloud over their head full of drama and darken an entire room. A being that is in a bad way, a bad attitude or whatever. Look what one human being over there in Russia is doing in the world right now. A human being is powerful. You get a human being to being reckless, a human being to having an agenda, it's hardcore on anybody near that human being. So I'm just one of those guys that you're not going to be able to convince there's a such thing as a weak-willed woman or a weak-willed man, right? The Bible says there's a weak-willed woman. The Bible says it. It says that a man takes advantage over a weak-willed woman, which means she's weaker than that man. Both of them are extremely powerful. He just happens to be more powerful than that particular woman, but a woman by herself is powerful. Any human being is powerful, even a baby. A baby can cry and make everybody in the room start jumping and doing anything and everything for that baby, getting them food, changing diapers, whatever, jumping, 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 and getting people to want to jump on each other for not jumping fast enough for the baby. Even a baby is abundantly powerful. Human beings are really, really powerful. And he says, we can buy the flesh. That's how powerful we are. We, in our flesh, quenching the spirit. That's major. And so he says, God had to do it. it. The law was powerless to do it. So God did it. Verse three and a half. What the, what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in a likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So God is more powerful than his law because his law is not made for him. His law is made for those that he created. And so he is above the law. And so he condemns sin in the flesh, verse four, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. So there's a righteous requirement of the law that has to be met. So when Jesus went to the cross, it was to fulfill this righteous requirement. It says in order. Not only does that mean in line with, but it also means because God ordered it. So in order that the righteous requirement, which is a requirement that God put forth as a provision, the requirement of that law will be fully met in us by Jesus Christ condemning sin in the flesh. So your flesh is condemned. So he was sent as a son in the likeness of sinful flesh to condemn sin in the flesh. So we are already condemned with the old birth, with the old order. We have to be a new creation. Verse four, in order that the righteous requirement might be met in us. Who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So it's telling us right there, in order for that righteous requirement of the law to be fully met in us, which means that the sin is condemned and yet you live, yet you live eternally for that to happen, you can't live according to it. You can't live according to that law. You can't live according to that provision. Why? Because one sin makes you a lawbreaker forever. So that side has to be done away with, canceled. So you can no longer, right? You can no longer say, well, it's because I sin less. Any of that kind of stuff. It's got to be because that provision, those rules, that law on that side no longer is applicable to me. 
Why is it no longer applicable? Because the righteous requirement of that law, which is to be sinless, is fully met in me because I live in Jesus Christ. So only if I'm in Jesus Christ do I get the credit for the provision that the law has been fully met in me because it was fully met in Jesus. So if I'm in Jesus, I'm getting the credit for it in Christ Jesus. How am I credited for it? We learned that months ago by faith, the faith that was credited to Abraham. So I have to have the faith in his righteousness. I can't start going, I'm sinning less. No, no, I can't start changing it to be something that it's not. It's got to be fully the faith that's met in Jesus Christ, the faith that Abraham had, and that's what I can be credited with. I can be credited being in Jesus. That's why he says the Father in me and I in them. May we be one. So that's what we have to do. So now we have to live according to the spirit, right? Well, the spirit is there in the beginning of creation. Go back to Genesis 1. Write this down in your notes, Genesis 1. And look at Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And it'll talk about that first verse, or first or second verse, and it will say, and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters at the beginning of creation. So a new creation is with the same spirit. Verse five says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. That's called a mindset. So when you live according to the flesh, that's your mindset, okay? But you can't live according to that mindset. So you have to have a new mindset. So a new creation requires a new mindset. Those who live according to the flesh, that's the old mindset. That's the mindset when I was born on the earth as a baby in human flesh. That flesh is already condemned. So I got to have a new mindset. What's that? I'm born again, a new creation. Well, that doesn't mean I just sin less. That's behavior modification. That means that I'm actually being deemed a different kind. So I have a new mindset. So those who live according to the flesh, the old mindset have their mindset on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mindset on what the spirit desires. When you have a mindset, that means you straight on focused. So I'm focused on everything that the spirit is desiring, not what the flesh desires. So if I got that paper and I got that line drawn and I got the spirit on one side and the flesh on the other side, well, they're starting to now separate. What does the word of God do? Divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow. So now it's starting to separate. Well, it's separating my thinking. I got to change the way I add up two plus two. Verse six says, the mind governed by the flesh. Wait a minute. It told us before, what? It's sin shall not be your master. And sinful flesh is what they're talking about here now. So the old way I think cannot be my master. So verse six says, the mind governed by the flesh is death. That means you see death, you think death, it's, it's, it, it controls your thinking. It's the most powerful thing in your world. That means that your thinking and your realm stops there. It stops at the grave. You can't see past it. So the mind governed by the flesh is death. Well, that makes perfect sense to me because we just studied a week ago and two weeks ago, two weeks back to back, that Jesus came and resurrected and he rolled around the earth with the disciples for 40 days before he ever ascended. So then that proves that being in Christ is above the grave. And it, it, it's not always oh, above the grave, but I haven't made it to heaven yet. So I'm in kind of midway land. I'm in limbo until I get to heaven. No, he actually rolled on the earth. So it's showing us that on the earth, you have to have a resurrected mindset. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. So when we don't have peace of mind, it is because there is something in reference to being a part of fallen mankind that's plaguing us.
It's something, whether it be a sickness, an illness, money problems, arguing with, with, with spouses or friends and family or, or seeing craziness on TV or a crazy movie or whatever it is, our own uh, fight within us is something, is, is something connected to the concept of fallen man, and that's death. So that means that if it controls us longer than it is for us to go to the word that will relieve us from that, then it's now controlling us. It's still mastering us because the word of God that was put together by the spirit isn't relieving us. Our minds are too strong. That's why the weakened flesh quench the spirit as we saw in verse one and verse two here on this particular chapter. That means your mind is too strong. Your flesh is too strong. Your worldly connection is too strong. Verse seven says the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. That's whether we know is hostile or not. Because God is going, I'm trying to be your master. That's why it says the mind governed. The spirit is trying to be your master. And it's trying to give you life and peace above any drama. And but the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Why? Because God's going, I'm trying to relieve you and you won't even accept the relief. No, no, no. I want to be like this. You go, no, you don't. I don't want to be like this. Actually, yes. Why? Because what does it take to get out of that? See, it takes something to get out of that. And so I must like it if I'm unwilling to do that which it takes to get out of it or or I'm too weak. That means I need to get strong people around me that can help get me out of that mental pit. But if I don't get with strong people to get me out of that mental pit or I say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Right. Uh, just let me be where I'm at. Then that's hostility to God. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. What's God's law? The law of the spirit. So it can't submit to the law of the spirit. So therefore it's being mastered still by the law of sin and death. That means the person is too worldly, too fleshly, too earthly. You go, wow, this is pretty deep. I, yeah, we got to actually dig in and dig that mindset out. So we have to actually change the way we think into every word that we're reading. And we got to hear it over and over and over again. And then we got to practice, train in it so that we can overcome that old self because that old self is tugging on us. Verse eight says, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. There it is. So it's a whole realm. A realm is powerful. So that means we're trapped inside of a realm, a realm of the flesh, a realm of the flesh. Yeah, that means a bunch of flesh, a bunch of folks, the mindset, the thinking, the past, the history, all of it is a realm. And we can't escape that realm. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Well, based on what we're reading here, then God has actually given us the ability to get out of it. But we're being hostile to God if we're not escaping it. So it's not that I, I can't get it. It's not that I, 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 can't, I can't achieve it. This is too difficult for me. I just can't do it. That's not what it's saying here. It's because it's saying those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. It didn't say those who are in the realm of the flesh is not your fault. God can't do anything because he's not strong enough. That's not what it says. It says we can't please God. So that should make us go. Then that means pleasing God is the thing that will actually get me to the higher realm. So I got to hear things, get myself to the place where pleasing God becomes my thing. That becomes my motivation. How is that going to happen? I got to get out of myself. How do I get out of myself? What did Jesus do for me? Oh, so it's about him. Yes, it's about his righteousness. It's about his faith. 
and it's about his spirit and it's about what he did for us, giving us the opportunity to escape this realm that's permeated and control the whole planet since the fall of Adam and Eve. And then he gives us an actual opportunity to actually escape that lower mindset. But he's saying for it to happen, for you to take control and grab a hold of that new mindset, that new creation mindset, you have to want, desire to please God. It can't be, well, I wanna do it, but it's, I wanna do it for me. It's gotta be for him. So that's the way you get it. You get it by going, okay, okay, I'm irrelevant here. God's got something going on. I was struggling with that just yesterday. And I, I, I took a walk and I turned on the quiet time from last week and I just listened to it. And I started, get, boom, it started raising me up. It started raising me up. By the time I got back home, I was in a lot better place than when I went out on the walk by playing the quiet time and listening to God's truth. Because then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free, right? So then it comes down to, okay, okay, God, what is it that you want? That's what gets us there. But if it's still got to be me looking for me inside of Christ Jesus, me looking like what's in it for me inside of Christ Jesus. Christ is like, I already went to the cross for you. I gave you everything. Why would you then still be looking at you inside of me when I already did everything for you? Now it's all about what I want. You took my place. I took your place. You took my place. Well, this is what I used to do. This is how I used to roll. Then you got to be, you got to have a gratitude, a gratitude for what God has done. That's going to get you out of the place that you're in. Verse nine says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. So there's two different laws. And there's two different realms. So on that same paper, put the realm of the flesh on the side of sin and death and put the realm of the spirit on the side of the spirit that gives life. And now you'll see also that there actually is two realms. So now when people tell you uh, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, you know that actually means a realm of the spirit. You can't say the kingdom of God but you're, everything about what you're talking about, everything about what you are is a realm of the flesh. You got to be talking about the world outside of the death, the life beyond the grave to be in the realm of the spirit. It says, but be in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. So God's going, it's impossible for you to be in the realm of the flesh, which is the side of sin and death, if the spirit of God is living in you, because it's the spirit of God. How in the world does the spirit of God doesn't want to please God? Is his own spirit, is him, right? The spirit of God is God, right? It's like, it's like, even, let's just look at the flesh real quick. As I'm talking to you right now, I'm sitting here at the desk on the computer. But the words that I'm saying is a sound. The flesh is not producing this sound, right? It's, it's the life that God gave you with this, the breath that's actually speaking and the, and the thoughts are not coming from the human flesh, it's coming from a realm. So th there's two programs, two programs that God created. There's one program which is called the realm of the flesh. That's a program. Now there's a zillion thoughts that exist in that program, but there is no thought that exists in that program that God did not create. And then the other side is another program, the realm of the spirit. So you get to choose which program you're going to be downloading your information from. That's your choice. You can't create a thought that does not exist in life that God created that's already in the heavenly realm in the universe. Like he, there's no new thought that humankind came up with outside of God's creativity. It doesn't make any sense. So you're either in one of these or the other. There's two realms, right? So if the spirit of God lives in you, 
that spirit is desiring its own realm. You say, well, they're both his realms. Yeah, but he separated them with two mindsets. And one of them, he's calling that one the spirit of God realm. And the other one, he's calling the flesh realm. He made them both, but they're two different realms that he's created. And he's calling the one the spirit of God. The other one is the opposite concept that he chose as a lower mentality, as a lower realm. You don't want that one. And he says, if any, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, so he went on to say the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ. So if indeed the spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ are one. It's the Holy Spirit. It's one. Verse 10, one spirit. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, your body, not the person coming up with the conversation, not the life that you have inside the body. That's why when the body goes to the grave, the, the person isn't there. Their body is there because because of sin, our bodies have to go to the grave. But the spirit of the person is the person that was living inside that body. That spirit is not there. The body is there, but the spirit isn't. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit lives because of righteousness. What spirit? The spirit of Christ. Because verse 10 said, but if Christ is in you. So Jesus Christ in the spirit is actually in us? Yeah. That's if we roll with the realm of the spirit. It can't roll any other way. So even in the body, you, you, you still must have it. That's why it says, but if in Christ is, if Christ is in you, then though your body is subject to death, so your body is still subject to death, but not your soul and spirit. The spirit gives life because of righteousness. What? Because of righteousness, because of his righteousness and your faith credited as righteousness. So you having faith credited as righteousness gives you the access to the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, and the law of the spirit. And you live according to the spirit where there is life and peace above death. That is heavy, heavy weight. That's what you get. And that is majorly beneficial. Amen. Hallelujah. 11 through 21. There's more to this chapter, but I'm going to stop at 21. You can read the rest of it yourself. But um, uh, uh, some of this we've talked about before. This is just a different angle to it um, because we're talking about a particular different subject matter. But verses 11 through 21, before the past. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. Who's that? The spirit of God. That means God himself. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. No, no, that's not God himself. That's the Holy Spirit. That's, remember last week I said people say the Holy Spirit and they go into ether land. The spirit of God means the Holy Spirit means the spirit of God. It's God the person his spirit. So, and if the spirit of him, God, who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. It didn't say living in you after you go to heaven. Living in you while you're in the body. The body goes to the grave. But while you're here walking among us today, the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you if, in fact, Christ is living in you. Then it says, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Do you hear that? He will give life to your mortal bodies. He didn't say life to your immortal body. That's the new body you will get in heaven. 
But he's going, while you're in the body right now, the Holy Spirit is life. And he will give a life to your mortal bodies. That means that you will have the brightness of the morning sun in your eyes, right? Don't mean you have to, you, it don't mean eyes physically. It means spiritually in your being, right? In your physical body, but in your being, the continents, the, the fired upness, all of that. He's telling you, how do you do it? It can't be about you. And so just by it not being about you, then he ends up making it about you, right? It's about him, but then he's about you. And so he will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So it's about his spirit, but his spirit is living in you. So if his spirit is living in you, then it's giving life to your mortal bodies. That means there's going to be something different even about you physically. Verse 12 says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute, man. This is so, that's why I said separate the paper in two sides because we have an obligation because there's a law of the spirit. So if there's a law of the spirit, then there's an obligation, but the obligation is not to the flesh. Well, Rodney, it just said he's going to give life to our mortal bodies. Yeah, life to our mortal bodies. But it's still about the spirit in the mortal body, not the mortal body in and of itself. So we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, not to the human body to live according to it. Not according to what? Not according to the law of sin and death. Not according to the old person. Not according to the person that was born, in my case, in Brooklyn, New York, in December 14th. Not that person, right? You got your own dates, your own places, your own hospitals, the houses, wherever you were born. Not according to that person. According to the person that God placed the spirit in. So it is the obligation is not to the flesh to live according to it. Verse 13 says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Whoa. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. Well, you already said your body is going to die because of the sin. But he's saying you will die. That means your spirit, that, that soul, that soul will die if that soul does not separate itself from the flesh. That soul will live if that soul separates itself from the flesh. So I have to devote my soul to the spirit that's calling me. But if you don't, you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Well, wait a minute now. Rodney, that's contradictive. Because now it's talking about misdeeds of the body. That starts to sound like the law. The law of Moses where, you know, sins. And God's going, you must go after the perfection. But you're not going to reach it. But you got to go for it. That's for those people who say, well, I got grace and there's a license to sin. God is not giving you the credit for sinning less. He's giving you the credit for living by faith, and he gives you the grace to see how you're going about your life. You can't be going about being on the wild on purpose saying, I have grace. You got to be still wrestling, fighting. That's why he says uh, uh, your salvation with fear and trembling. So you've still got to go after being righteous in your body. Although that in and of itself is not going to do it. That's the difference. The difference is people were saying that in and of itself is going to do it. So now they're going after this misdeeds of the body, but they've thrown away the other 11 verses. The other 11 verses was talking about the higher self, the spiritual self, tapping into the spirit, having faith. All those things must accompany that too. Plus, you're going for trying to be righteous with your body, all of it included. 
So the game didn't get less. The program didn't get less. The program actually got harder. But Jesus is given grace. So you serve with fear and trembling because he's still in control of the judgment seat. And you don't know how he's going to do what he's going to do. So he put it that way for a reason. So we're not running around acting like fools, just acting like fools. Because we don't know what he's going to do. That's why we can't look at somebody else and say, well, they did that and they didn't go through that situation. Well, if they did that, looks like, you know, the minister did X, Y, Z, or this Bible talk leader did X, Y, Z, or this other person who's supposed to be a strong Christian is doing X, Y, Z. I guess I can do it. Well, we already did the recap game where that can't be what's leading you. It's got to be the word of God. So you still must put to death the misdeeds of the body, right, by the spirit. That means that if I only try to put uh, the death, the misdeeds of the body by the flesh, it's not going to work. I have to tap into the spirit. The stronger I get spiritually, the more I won't want to do the other things. So it's not that the Holy Spirit is making me sin less, because making me sin less is not going to be the thing that's going to get me to heaven. It's the spirit is raising me up above it where sin is not going to be my master. I'm already forgiven for that. So I got to have the spirit of gratitude. God is saying that if I just focus on the works, it's not going to work. If I try to bare knuckle it, it's not going to work. If I try to just, okay, let me not sin, God, let me not, that's not going to work. I actually have to tap into gratitude. If I grab it, if, I, if I'm focused on the gratitude of what Jesus has done for me, and I get more and more in tune to who Christ Jesus is that's living in me, that will lift you up. That's why he said the same spirit who rose Christ from the dead. So the spirit has to raise us up not you wrestling in and of itself in the flesh. You got to wrestle the flesh to focus in on the spirit and the spirit is what will lift us up above the misdeeds of the body. Then you will live. Verse 14 says, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. So if you're led by the flesh, you're not the children of God. Doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't matter what we're trying to pull off. If we're trying to pull it off by the flesh, it's not going to get it. If we're led by the Spirit of God, that's the same Spirit that rose Jesus, raised Jesus from the dead. Then the only way we could be, be led by the Spirit of God is being called higher. The higher we get lifted up, the lower the craziness looks to us, and it becomes silly to us. Then we don't want to be a part of it because he's given us victory over the silliness, right? By raising us up. So we have to look to the higher self. We got to look to God who is igniting the higher self. And the higher self is the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ living in us where we become spiritual. Verse 15 says, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. So we can't be living with the fear of the sin. He's got to raise us up above that to a mature level, to a higher level. We're not running around focused on sins and tripping off of sins. We're too focused on being powerful in Christ Jesus by the gratitude we have for God in Christ Jesus. We're living for the full, not the cup half empty, right? It's the cup half full, not the cup half empty. I'm getting stronger than Christ. I'm drawing closer to the Father, not I need to stop these sins. I need to stop these sins. That's 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 the lower, that's the lower level. Hey, I need to go do something powerful for God. Let's go. That's the higher level. So it's not making you a slave so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Bam, gratitude. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. The God of all creation has actually taken me who was condemned in the flesh and has raised me up to be a royal child. 
a royal priesthood, a co-heir with Jesus Christ. That alone, focusing on that alone is supposed to elevate us. We got to hear it all the time. You hear me saying it all the time. We got to hear it all the time. We got to be reminded all the time of who we are in Christ Jesus and get fired up about that and then say, okay, God, let's go. I'm, I'm fired up again. Let's go for the game. Thank you for making me a son or daughter in Christ Jesus. And it says, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. So you see the capital S on the spirit. You see the small S on our spirit, that person inside, the person that when you speak, you're talking, right? That means if you're speaking and talking and it's not by the spirit, we now know that's a powerful person. So speaking not spiritual is, 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 is devastating. Speaking and not speaking spiritual is a powerful, lethal weapon. So we got to be careful of what we say. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children, right? Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. We studied that last week where he says, Father, I've given them the glory you've given me. And so he's going, okay, we saw where he had to go through some stuff to get that glory. Well, we're going through some stuff, but we get the glory. So now we go, okay, I was just thinking about that earlier this morning. I was like, you know what? Any kind of suffering I'm going through, God's just showing me like, yeah, that's what I went through. And, I, and it's like, okay, well, we're going to make it that day. And I was like, man, do I, gotta, do I have enough in the tank? Do I have enough in the tank to go through this earth forever, however long left I got in it to hold on to focusing on his glory to get me the, the, the fuel I need to pull it through? while dealing with this crazy old world and the craziness that happened in our lives. Do I have enough fuel? I got to get the word of God. And so when I go and study out the word or listen to a quiet time or whatever the case, it just gives me some fuel enough to take another step. That's why I got to go to the word every day. I don't know about everybody else, but I got to, because if I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to have that light. I'm not going to be a light. I'm going to be a heavy weight to somebody. And so it says, present suffering and future glory. We'll conclude it here. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That means it's in us. It's wanting to reveal itself. So we have received something in us that we don't necessarily know what it is. Remember, he says he's going to give life to our mortal bodies, not even compare it to also. We're also going to have a revelation about who we are in the new body in heaven. But even in this body, there's glory. There's the spirit of Christ, which is the glory that's making us into a new creation while we're in this body right now. And that glory is wanting to come out right now and be revealed where it will even shock us. It'll definitely shock anybody that's ever known you that's not known you to be this fired up, running around person fired up in life. Verse 19 says, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Hold on now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. The creation waits in eager expectation. The creation, that means the heavens and the earth. That means everything in Genesis 1 that was created, it in itself waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Well, that makes perfect sense because when man fell, God said, cursed is the ground because of you. And because of you now, there's going to be thorns and thistles and it's going to be harder and man's going to have to work by the sweat of his brow, etc. So the creation took a hit when man took a hit. So the creation is waiting for us to roll so that the creation can roll. So the sons, the children of God, the sons and daughters of God will actually make the earth and the universe dance. That's how powerful you are. 
So a negative connotation, a negative continence, a negative feeling, negative beliefs, uh, 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 not being fired up has an effect on the creation itself. That's why you can have a bad attitude walk into your house and bring the whole house down. You can wreck an atmosphere, any of us, any of us can wreck an atmosphere by being down. People look at you and they get down, especially if people are used to being down and they got fired up for a second and you came in not fired up, you came up down and they so used to that, they down again, right? That you can't afford that. The creation can't afford it. So verse 19 says, the creation is waiting in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Well, that's some of the worth, that glory that's revealed in us, that the creation itself is rolling off of what we got. And verse 20 says, for the creation was subjected to frustration. So the creation is frustrated. Why? Because we're frustrated. Why? Because we're dealing with sin. So the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. So you can't come in a place negative and then say, well, I shouldn't have no effect on you. You come into the place negative, people are going to be negative because of you not by their own choice, because you didn't came in and jacked up the environment, right? So the creation was subject to frustration, not by his own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Wait, the creation is in bondage to decay. We all know what bondage means. That means slavery. So the creation is also a slave to sin. Hot dog. The creation is a slave to sin. And sin is why we decay. So we age like we do because of being in a fallen man status. And so the earth is aging too. Infrastructure is aging too. And it's decaying too. All because we fail. All right, so the creation itself is trying to get liberated from its bondage to decay. It's trying to get brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. So that's how much is riding on us. God has put the whole universe and the earth riding on the children of God so that you can get fired up so that, you know, like I said, you go to a depressed home and it doesn't look the same. It's going to look run down and just some regular old humans, right? Because it, 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 it's, it's made of living matter, right? And so, hey, um, let's not be that. Let's not bring tearing things down by our uh, attitudes and, and not having the continent. God is trying to lift us up into the spiritual realm where there's a whole lot of power that's in us, that's coming from us. And then when we go around people, people will, will feel it. You get 10 of us together and we walk into a room and people will be like, what the heck just happened? Because the energy that came up in that room would be some serious, powerful energy. That's what we're supposed to have so that people can actually feel the difference. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We are either reigning as priests or we are not, says the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And we are reigning on the earth. And it says in 1 Peter 2, 9, he has made us into a royal priesthood. We now know what that is all about. It's all about being a royal priesthood while we're on this earth, connecting to the spirit and we being spiritual beings, a new creation unlike there's ever been. It was not like that in the beginning of mankind. We are something different. Amen. I was thinking about what you said about how people can walk into a room and just bring down the whole, the whole level of the room, which is why we need to continue to meet with our Lord, our master and, and fill our, our energy up because 
if we're going to be ambassadors for him, we've got to plug into him each and every day. And if we're going to be spreading the good news, which is, you know, the Great Commission, um, we're bringing that spirit with us wherever we go. And there are some people I've experienced, there are some people that are not of him. And they can darken a room when they walk in. And uh, you, uh, you can feel that. I mean, the presence, the aura is there. And, and, and it's just scary how we're, we're wrestling with all these different um, energies here on earth. Yeah, isn't it amazing? Yeah. And I love the word that you're using, energy, because that's what it is. It's an energy, a positive energy. And you come into a room with positive energy and, and that becomes affectious and not not a fake positive energy, right? A, a, a energy from the Lord, because that's going to be another level, right? And so if you come in with that, people start to feel that and they're like, man, some people even ask you what you all happy about. Bingo, opportunity to share. Because you ask me, what am I happy about? You ask me what I'm fired up about. Oh mm -hmm. shoot, I did a quiet time this morning. Boy, that thing lit me up. A quiet time, what's that? Oh, well, I studied the word of God. You all fired up about the Bible? Please. Man, I read this stuff this morning. Bam, 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 bam. Now it's not even you preaching at somebody. It's, it's you sharing your faith about why you're fired up. That's what sharing your faith is supposed to actually be about, right? That's what the lady at the well did. Jesus spoke to her, started telling her stuff that was she had never heard, and he's telling her about her life, and he could, he could see in her. She went and told everybody, come see this man that told me, right? That, that was the excitement. She didn't go, hey, come join this guy's church. <laughs> come see what this guy told me. They they got amped up, but this lady must be amped up. Now who knows? She had to be. Look, I mean, she she was married five times. The person she was with wasn't her husband. Jesus told her the truth. She didn't get down by that. She didn't put her head down and go, "Oh God, he's he's calling me out on my sin." Right? She was like, "Whoa, wait a minute! This this dude can see this. <laughs> he's just sitting here at the well." She was so fascinated about the Lord being the Lord that her sin was irrelevant. It was the excitement about who he was, not who she was. And so she went around telling everybody who he was. That was her excitement. That's what we're supposed to be about, right? I just read something this morning that was incredible, right? Jessica, I tell you, I go do some out. She'll, she'll be waking up. I, she got to get coffee. Yet. I, I won't even let her get the coffee yet. She's just like, I'm like, oh, you should just quiet time. I just did ain't no joke, right? And it's like, she's like, every, that's every time, every time you act like it's the brand new quiet time you just got for the first time. Mm -hmm. It's who's in us. It's who's in us. And it's uh, surprising that you did go there with the woman at the well because when I started reading the Bible as an adult, uh, you know, I, I was 38 years old when I received him, and um, that's who I was. I was a woman at the well, you know, and not till I started actually laying my eyes on the word itself did he show me, that's me! Oh my gosh, that's me! There's hope for me. And, um, you know, I, he put my feet on solid ground and turned me around, and people in my life had seen that woman of the well and I was I was different I was different I was telling everybody about you know the man I met you know the man that came into my life the, the word that I started reading and they saw a different me even though they remembered my life and and um, you, you, you can't you, you're just not the same you're not the same anymore you know even though you're still dealing with that flesh you're still dealing with that same flesh you see things differently you, you, you desire different things you you're a new creation like you said you're a new relation uh, creation 
took about that is that you're right so on the money because see if we make it about us and we're still wrestling somebody's going to see something in that wrestling that's not going to be on point and then they're going to say see 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 that's why it can't be on us right because you got to believe that the woman at the well if she was living with the man that wasn't her husband she had to go and either move out of his spot or move him out something would have to go down so she couldn't make it about her because if they saw her falter at any other point in time they're gonna say see 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 and that's what people do yeah, that's what that's what the that's what the enemy does points the finger whenever you falter this that's why it can't be about us it's got to be about him and let me introduce you to him this is what he's done for me and this is what I'm I'm jumping on that road. I'm not jumping off that road. I'm rolling with him. This is what I learned from him. This is my advice to you is to get with him because I don't know what he's going to do with the next person. That's why I got to introduce them to Jesus, right? That's been always been my thing. Let me introduce somebody to who he is, Jesus. I don't know what he's going to do with them. He could do for the, he could do with them something infinitely stronger than he can do with me. My job is just to tell you about who he is. Now you tap into that and have a relationship with him. That's what it's about. I right. think the the whole concept of just being able to see forward and not being able to focus on what's present uh, as far as troubles or, or things like that and being able to focus on a future glory that's still in us or that's going to be made present in us is what really separates us from a lot of the other people that I've talked to is why is your joy and my joy is because it's here it's here it, there is a future joy but most of my joy is here in being able to help people's lives and being able to study the word and be able to, being able to understand the father before I actually stand before him rather than feeling condemnation or judgment I feel like I'm getting closer to the father to meet him and the joy that that will bring. Like the song says, will I stand before you? Will I kneel? Will I cry? I, I don't know what I'll do, you know, when I stand before you. And, yeah. you know, will I, I work? Imagine. I can only imagine. And mm -hmm. I don't know what it's gonna be like when I stand before God. What what will it be? I, I, I have no clue. But all you know is you wanna be there standing before him on that day, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, with them um, in the scriptures, where it says that the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace, but the mind governed by the flesh is death. Yeah, it's so important the way we think affects our lives. Because when we don't have that peace, it means we're just not thinking in accord to what God tells us to think. You know, that faith in Him, all His promises, all His, all the goodness that He has for us. When we're being negative and thinking the old ways, it doesn't help us at all. And so it's so important to continue to keep that word, not only every day, every moment, and change those bad thoughts into that scriptures that remind us of what he's saying in reality. And another thing is where it says that the spirit gives life, life because of righteousness not anything good that we do, but faith in Him, on His power, and believe on that, and, and just, um, yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot, but at the same, it's simple, keeping our eyes on Jesus. It's a trust, and that's the magic, right? That's the, that's like, this says, test me in this. And so, even in these situations where we are in different places, we start to wrestle with stuff, and I know yesterday I was wrestling and, and God's like, that's when you get to test me. Put it on me, see if my word does what I say. See if I can allow the craziest situation that you can imagine in your life and I overcome that in your life. That's the test. So when the craziest situation happens, it's actually an incredibly great test that will render an incredibly great reward. And so that's what believing in Jesus going to the cross is all about. Because then we say, 
that's the worst situation you can think of. The worst situation you can think of is not ours. The worst situation you can think of is God putting his own son on the line for all mankind when his son did nothing wrong. We actually did something wrong. That's why it's not the worst scenario. His son is the worst scenario because his son was perfectly and yet he had to go through it. I get there sometime where I got to do stuff. Somebody need me to do something. I'm doing some stuff, people. And I'm like, man, I'm so spent. I'm overwhelmed. Why do I got to do it? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then I go, man, Jesus went on the cross and he didn't say, why do I got to do it? Like, that's crazy. That's crazy level. So that's what getting out of yourself is. How fast can we transfer the situation from ours to looking at his? How quick, how quick can we do that? The faster you can think God than Jesus instead of ourselves, the quicker we'll get lifted up. But if we're in the me, well, man, I feel, I think I am right. And, and that's why it said mindset where your mind always go to you first. Like everything that you hear, you instantly go to self. Then that's some serious practice and training that it's going to take to try to like, what do I need to do to stop myself from everything that happens thinking me first? Let me, let me think Jesus first. Let me think God first. And that's what happened when I said, why do I got to always do this for this and do this? And then I said, wait a minute, Jesus, that's crazy. He did that on steroids. And then I, I, I realized how weak I sound. Then it's like, okay, you know what, God, let me straighten up. Let me go over here and, and dig into your word. And then he comes back and strengthens you. Even after you've just acted like a knucklehead in your brain and complained about something that's really small. <laughs> and you're like, I went to the cross. You're like, oh, shoot. Okay. God's like, that's why it's like, it's cool to see a scripture and see that you've been a knucklehead about it, right? Because if he's not showing you you've been a knucklehead about it, then you'll be deceived. But if he's willing to show you you've been a knucklehead about it, he's loving you because he's going, hey, you've been a knucklehead about this. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry about that, God. Let me get you straight. He's like, cool. Let's go. I got you. And then he goes ahead and gives you the strength. That's what he did for me yesterday when I start walking. So let me go walk and listen to this word. I listen to that word and it's like getting stronger and stronger. Every step I took, it's like, okay, you know what? I got my stuff, I got my mojo back. I can get ready to roll because I knew I had to do today. And I go, I don't know where I'm gonna be at tomorrow. I don't know where, what strength I'm gonna have, what energy I'm gonna have, what spirit come coming. I don't know what it's gonna be tomorrow when I do this quiet time for folks, but then, Therein lies the strength. I feel extremely fired up right now. So God did what he does. And he's saying, that's how you got to mm -hmm. actually roll with every day. Just get out of yourself. So. Yeah. You have to go have that quiet time with him. You have to have that quiet time with him so he could speak to you. Seek his counsel so he could tell you where to go and how to speak. And that it is. Plug into that energy. Plug into that energy. Mm-hmm. Like, like, like solar panels. <laughs> yep. Right. Right. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us every time, Father, to letting us know what you want from us. I ask you, Father, to please be with every family you represented here, with all the brothers and sisters that couldn't come to the Bible talk. Protect them and help them, Father to be close to you. I ask you, Father, for all the people that are suffering right now across the world, to give hope, Father, in their hearts, and to help us all, Father, to always keep our eyes on you. We love you, we praise you, Father, we give you the glory to you alone, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 And to the amen, thank you guys amen. so much for another thank day. Yes, thank you great weekend you guys have a great weekend and until next time peace in peace in bye everybody bye everybody bye, bye. 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 bye.